Okay, does that look good if anyone? Yeah, all right. Um, so aloha everyone and thanks so much for coming to my defense today. As Pat mentioned, I'll be taking you on the journey of the work that I've done over the past two and a half years towards developing improved mosquito monitoring in high elevation forests on Hawaii Island. So when I submitted my thesis draft to Pat, he said, it looks good, but you know, in the case of a master's defense, you really should use I instead of we, because um, I wrote the whole thing saying, we did this, we did that. And while I understand this, and I will mostly or try to use I today to talk about the work that was done, I really mean we. Um, this project in my mind has been a really collective and collaborative effort, effort both of struggle and triumph. Um, I think there are a few people here listening or in this room uh, that haven't trudged through the rain to collect data with me, wrestled through stats on R, patiently showed me for the thousandth time how to properly pipette, or simply been a smiling and supportive presence along the journey. So to all of you, I am so grateful. I also wanna recognize the enormous privilege that I've had to work both in Hawaii and in the places of my research. Um, the experiences I've had here have really grounded me in what it means to build a relationship to place and to care for that place. And I always tried to keep my mind towards how I could be a positive force um, and just put my whole self into everything that I did. So this objective is really what gave me my drive. And, um, and I learned how to do that um, from all of you, um, the community around me. And, and I learned a lot about um, what my kuleana or like my responsibilities to the places that I'm from and also the places that I go to. So today I'll start off talking about mosquitoes and disease, the impact they've had on wise native forest birds and the environmental drivers of invasion. I'll then go on um, through the two chapters of my thesis, which the first being a study on a comprehensive low cost mosquito monitoring um, surveillance project in high, two high elevation forest refugia, and the second, uh, the development of an environmental DNA assay to monitor larval mosquito populations of Culex quinquefasciatus. And I'll finish with conclusions, collaborations, and acknowledgments. So mosquitoes have been terrorizing planet Earth for millennia. They're a group of organisms that everybody can relate to, evoking such disdain, irritation, and antipathy that just about anyone's open to talk trash about mosquitoes. <laughs> but in most places around the world, when we talk about mosquitoes, it's because of their threat to humans. They're our deadliest predator and responsible for over 700,000 deaths per year. But if you think sharks are scary, then mosquitoes definitely are. So in Hawaii, we have a unique reason to despise mosquitoes. And when we talk about them, it's primarily because of the birds. While mosquitoes in Hawaii do present a threat to humans, the biggest threat we currently face is for conservation. And the species that I was concerned with for my work is the southern house mosquito, Helix quinquefasciatus. Helix, a tropical mosquito, um, is a tropical mosquito whose accidental introduction to the islands has since devastated native Hawaiian bird populations that evolved in the absence of avian malaria, a disease transmitted by Culex and caused by the parasite Plasmodium delictum. So this story is one, like many, aggravated by climate change. As a tropical mosquito, Culex are not tolerant to the cold, which has limited their distribution to low elevations. But as temperatures have risen nearly three degrees uh, over the last century, mosquito distribution and the avian diseases they transmit follow. The effects of spreading avian disease have been catastrophic for native bird populations with an escalation in declines over the past 20 years and four species predicted to go extinct within the next 10 without rapid conservation action. While suitable climate conditions determine broadly where uh, vector and parasite development are possible, they're not the only environmental factors that influence vector abundance. Local studies have found that the establishment of mosquitoes is driven in part by the availability of larval habitat. So in wet forests, the most important larval habitat for Culex are rock pools along intermittent stream beds and cavities in native pu'u tree ferns created by the foraging of feral pigs. In forests with pigs and pu'u, these cavities fill with rainwater and leaf litter, leaving standing water that provide a 
optimal microbreeding habitat for mosquito larvae. These are two key ingredients for mosquito invasion. Population declines and extinction can follow. But this story of decline is one that we're ready to stop telling. So this is what the birds of Pakalau sound like. Pakalau Forest National Wildlife Refuge is representative of the important role that high elevation forests fulfill. And despite increasing disease prevalence, uh, across the islands, hawklaws really remained a major stronghold for native forest birds. And that's until recent years where climate models uh, showing rising temperatures along with population studies have begun to show the decline of nearly all species in the closed forests of the refuge, highlighted in pink, um, indicating that the conditions may be changing. So the managers of the state's refugia are faced with a dynamic challenge. Monitoring across these systems is costly and labor intensive, limiting the frequency and feasibility of tracking the fine scale changes that could warn of an encroaching mosquito invasion and the heightened threat of disease for birds. Mosquito surveys are often sporadic, occurring anywhere from several times per year to once every several years at a particular site and most of the time are limiting, limited by funding availability. So under current bird and mosquito monitoring protocols, innovation could go in undetected until it's too late. And with significant advances towards the local implementation of novel mosquito controls like Wolbachia-based population suppression, there's an increased need for detailed monitoring um, that can inform mosquito abundance estimates, which can then help us determine timing, locations, and um, ratios of releases, as well as the efficacy of these efforts. So given the challenges that state resource managers face, my first chapter focused on exploring and testing a comprehensive, low-cost, um, continuous surveillance approach to monitor the conditions for uh, invasion and establishment of disease-carrying mosquitoes into two high-elevation forest refugia. So building upon studies over the past 20 years, I employed a three-tier surveillance approach to monitor adult mosquito populations, determine the distribution of feral pig-created larval habitat, its persistence on the landscape over time, and patterns of larval occupancy, and assess the seasonal variation in temperature, allowing for modeling of vector and avian malaria suitability conditions using local data. So now getting into some of my methods and results. My two primary study sites were Hakalau Forest National Wildlife Refuge in the green and La Pahoehoe Forest Reserve in the blue, both located on the eastern slope of Mauna Kea. We established two elevational gradient transects within Hakalau and a third at La Pahoehoe across approximately 300 meters um, elevation, and that was intended to be comparable across sites. For adult mosquito surveillance, I performed validation experiments of the passive Gravid 80s trap, also known as the GAT, monitored both at Hakalau and La Pahoehoe, and conducted comparative trap efficacy experiments. So due to the remoteness of my study sites, GATs were selected as a low cost, lightweight trapping option since they're easy to haul into the field and don't require a power source. These traps can also be left out uh, for weeks at a time, making them ideal for trapping in remote areas and for conducting continuous monitoring. But one disadvantage um, is in their name. So they're considered passive because they rely on the mosquito to trap itself, uh, which um, may have costs in trap efficacy. And by this, I mean the mosquito actually has to fly into the trap and get caught to a sticky card um, inside. So to validate these traps, uh, capacity to capture Culex. I ran two experiments at two low elevation, high mosquito density sites and compared capture rates among infusion types, which are the attractant that lures uh, the mosquito into the trap, as well as trap weeks. So from 2020, 2020 to 2022, I ran 51 GATs across my three transects, represented by the blue dots, um, there were 17 gats placed on each of those transects, sep separated by 15 to 25 meters elevation, and had active trap periods of 9 to 16 trap nights. 
Because I was using a passive trap, I wanted to compare these capture rates with um, the, those of active traps, which use a battery-powered battery fan in addition to a lure to capture mosquitoes, but are really heavy and logistically complicated to take to the field. And as many of you know, that is a car battery, which isn't really fun to carry into the forest. <laughs> So to do this, I collaborated with DOFA to run comparative efficacy experiments that paired one of each of these trap types um, at a sam single sampling station across four sites. From the GAT validation experiments, I found that GATs did capture Culex at these low elevation, high density mosquito sites with 72 total captures in 225 trap nights. Um, I also found that the adapted field brew shown in the middle bar of the graph caught significantly more Culex relative to the rainwater dilution, um, and that informed tarping the traps to prevent decreased captures resulting from the rain. I also wanted to note that due to the high level of zeros in my data pretty much across the board, um, nearly all the statistical analyses that I did were performed using non-parametric or negative binomial distributions to account for that over-dispersion of zeros. I also found that trap week influences capture rates, and this is important to determine um, how long traps were attractive in the field. The field brew on week one showed a weak but positive increase in capture rates, um, while the field brew on week two in blue had a higher mean capture rate, but demonstrated decreasing captures over time. And for both treatments, the maximum capture rates occurred between trap nights six to nine. So with extensive trapping effort, I found minimal evidence of the establishment of Culex uh, from GAT captures at either site. At Hakalau in 5,721 trap nights, I caught zero mosquitoes. I had um, detections of the cold tolerant invasive mosquito Aedes japonicus in, at both sites um, with 22 captures at La Hoi Hoi and a single Culex capture. Uh, all of those mosquito captures at La Hoi Hoi occurred in approximately uh, the elevational gradient that was below what I was able to monitor at Hakalau just due to difficulty of access, which is another important detail. So for Culex, um, active BGCO2 traps outperformed both the active CDC Gravid and the passive GAT, capturing 97% of all Culex um, during the study. One Culex was, capture was made in the CDC Gravid trap and zero captures were made in the GATs. Um, and interestingly, for Aedes japonicus, the CDC Gravid trap had the highest capture rates. Of the total Culex captured in BG traps, 30 of those were at Kianakolu, um, a high elevation site adjacent to Hakalau, but not one of my long-term study sites. And over the entire monitoring period, um, the only Culex captured at Hakalau was at 1,671 meters, which is a pretty high elevation capture. And um, past intermittent mosquito surveys have had few detections of Culex, um, and this capture was first in the upper portion of the Puakala, um, of the Puakala portion of the refuge. So my next objective was to investigate uh, the feral, feral pig created larval habitat. And to do this, I conducted a distribution survey and monitored Hapu'u cavities over the long term. So the distribution survey was a snapshot of larval habitat across fenced and unfenced portions of Hakalau and the unfenced portion of La Hoi Hoi. These surveys were done along contiguous plots measuring five meters wide by 100 meters long. And when cavities were identified, they were measured, assessed for presence of water, larvae, and attributed an age grade using standard operating procedures uh, that, had pre that had previously been established, uh, and all cavities were also marked to produce a distribution map. Each time that I visited Hawklaw, I surveyed these Apu'u cavities for the presence of larvae. And at La Poi Poi, due to the abundance of cavities, I selected a subset of 36 to track over 11 months. 
During this time, I collected data on larval habitat availability, larval occupancy, cavity lifespan, um, as well as changes in pH and conductivity of the water within those cavities. At Hakalau, fenced areas had lower hupu'u cavity density compared to unfenced areas, with 75% occurring in the unfenced portion of the refuge. And La Pupoihoi had higher hupu'u cavity density compared to the unfenced portion of Hakalau, despite significantly less area surveyed. At Hakalau, I made no larval culex detections, while detections of Aedes japonicus were consistent in one hupu cavity and periodically in rock pools. At La Pohoihoi, I detected Aedes japonicus in over 50% of the cavities throughout the year, shown in the green bars at the bottom of the slide. And with the occurrence of culex in the blue, only during the months of uh, the warmest, the highest mean ambient temperatures. I also wanted to point out that when those culex detections were made, um, they were in cavities that also had Aedes japonicus. So I defined larval habitat availability by cavities that, that hold water for gravid mosquitoes to lay their eggs. I found that the relative abundance of these wet cavities fluctuated over the year, ranging anywhere from 0%, like in January, to 90%, uh, like in November but didn't have a significant correlation with rainfall. Um, this could be due to the missing data um, because we can't see the general trends of rainfall relative to the proportion of wet cavities. So the, the months with the lowest rainfall have the highest proportion of, of dry cavities. Um, these data show the dynamics of these cavity habitats on the landscape, which can have distinct implications for each species. Uh, the eggs of Culex are not drought tolerant, so like those of 80s, so they can dry out in just a few hours of larval habitat um, going dry. And considering this life history trait, we can expect that during a dry year, Culex reproduction might be particularly impacted. Over these 11 months, I monitored the same 21 cavities, uh, adding 15 additional ones in the first few months to increase the sample size of the hard to find fresh and intermediate ages. I found that while cavities aged rapidly, they persisted over time. On average, fresh cavities lasted one to two months and the intermediate stage lasted two to five months. Of the 10 cavities identified as old at the beginning of the surveys, 80% were still capable of holding water at the end of the study, demonstrating a lifespan of greater than 11 months. In total, 31% of those cavities were destroyed and could no longer hold water, either from rotting, cracking, or the accumulation of uh, soil and leaf litter. The physical chemical parameters um, of the water, they also changed over time and with cavity age and could be informative in determining occupancy trends. So mean pH values increased over the sampling period and marginally as cavities aged, uh, but there was considerable variance in these values. Regardless of cavity age, all cavities were acidic and pH values below four can slow larval development and reduce survival. Conductivity was distinct, decreasing both over time and as cavities aged. And higher conductivity values like those seen in the fresh cavities are indicative of nutrient-rich or polluted water and have been positively associated with Culex presence. Um, but my low number of detections of Culex couldn't really inform this. So finally, to assess vector and parasite suitability conditions at both sites, I collected local climate data and performed an avian malaria suitability analysis. I placed three climate sensors at the same elevation along each of the transects and measured temperature at 10 minute intervals from August, 2021 to December, 2022. The avian malaria suitability analysis was made according to a model by Lucas Fortini and co-authors and applied to my locally collected temperature data. So this model defines suitability conditions based on two thermal requirements. The first is a daily mean threshold temperature that for Culex mosquito development from egg to adult, this threshold is close to 10 degrees. 
While for plasmodium parasite development, it's around 13 degrees Celsius. And the second thermal requirement in, in the model is cumulative degree days, which basically is the thermal accumulation above the threshold temperature over time given by the mean daily temperature used to predict development. So once the cumulative degree days are met for either the vector or parasite, the subsequent days are classified into three categories. Not suitable for vector or parasite development, suitable for Culex vector development only, or suitable for both vector and parasite development. So based solely on the temperature thresholds uh, given by the local climate data with month on the x-axis and then the mean ambient temperature, or mean monthly temperature on the y, I found that the mean temperatures necessary for Culex development uh, were present year round across all elevations, um, represented by the lines above, the, um, above that orange threshold. And Seasonality was observed for the conditions of plasmodium relictum, which is shown in the pink. With the model output that incorporated degree days together with the temperature, the minimum temperature thresholds, we're able to see a more detailed picture of vector and parasite suitability across the landscape. So across all sites at the lowest elevation, suitability conditions were present for both vector and parasite development year round. And as we move up to the middle elevation, we start to see the seasonality and parasite development. At Puakala and Hakalau, there's a period from February to late June where only vector development is possible. While at Laupahoehoe, there's an additional four months of suitability. Similar evidence of Laupahoehoe's warmer temperature tendency was evident at the highest elevation at Puakala, or at the highest elevation. And at Puakala and Hakalau, there was six and a half months per year where that both um, vector and parasite development were possible. While at Laupahoehoe, it was extended by approximately two months. So in visualizing all of these graphs together, while basic temperature patterns are the same, we see site-specific variation in temperature and suitability conditions across the landscape potentially driven by microclimates present between sites that result in subtle temperature differences. So a summary of my findings from this chapter. Um, first, extensive trapping effort from continuous monitoring using these low cost passive GATs revealed minimal evidence of the establishment of Culex across the two forest refugia despite the presence of suitable conditions for vector development year round. And although the efficacy of the traps uh, used were relatively low compared to active traps, the low numbers of mosquito captures together with the larval surveys are hopefully a good indication that Culex still exists at low densities at these sites and haven't yet uh, established resident populations. While the high elevation capture uh, in a BG doesn't necessarily invalidate the possibility of true zeros from GATS at lower elevations, the relatively low e efficacy of GATS compared to active traps casts doubt on whether the zeros represent true absence of mosquitoes on the landscape or a reflection of that low trap efficacy. Across both mosquito species, uh, active traps beat passive traps, and despite their appeal, GAT efficacy is likely too low to be used effectively as a um, as a in early warning system for mosquito techniques or for mosquito surveillance. Sorry, um, and further research would be great to improve the efficacy of these traps using things like sound to lure to lure mosquitoes into them. So throughout my surveys, I frequently detected Aedes japonicus, and the first detection of this cold tolerant mosquito was in 2003. And it's since rapidly established through the islands and across elevational gradients. Um, this movement upslope, as well as the cohabitation of Aedes in similar larval habitat as Culex, suggests that it could serve as a proxy for invasion um, for Culex in a warmer future. And another thing that I think is really interesting is that larval studies have shown evidence of weak interspecific competition 
between species, as well as reduce larval survival and size of Culex in the presence of high densities of Aedes stephanicus. So um, this hasn't been studied on the local landscape, but I think could be really cool future research. Um, next, fencing is appeared to be an effective man management measure to limit feral pig-created larval habitat, but the long lifespan of these cavities can limit um, the, or can delay the time that it takes for positive uh, effects from larval habitat reduction to occur from that fencing. So hapu'u cavities aged rapidly but persisted over time and showing that they're likely able to support viable larval habitat for several months to potentially years after being created. Um, and the reduction of hapu'u cavities has been cited as a, an important management action to reduce local mosquito populations. Um, but in sites with like Hoklaw that already have a really low density of these hapu'u cavities, it might not have such a significant impact on reducing those populations as compared to a site like La Pahoehoe that has a really high um, larval habitat availability. And another point here is that hapu'u cavities represent just one form of available larval habitat on the landscape. And there's some really important work being done right now looking at the importance of um, rock pools in intermittent stream beds as a corridor that can support invasion. Finally, the climate conditions for both vector and parasite development were, par were present at both sites um, for up to nearly 62% of the year at the highest elevations that I looked at. So this result shows uh, the reality of climate conditions that are present in the mid to high elevation closed forest of Hoklau and La Poihoi. And these results um, are not surprising. They support uh, extensive landscape analyses that have used modeling approaches previously to predict these climate conditions across the islands. Um, and the addition is that we leveraged here, the use of site-specific climate data um, without using that predictive modeling. Um, continuous climate surveillance like this in at-risk forest bird habitat, um, it's low cost and could also be a really valuable addition to mos mosquito surveillance techniques um, across the state. So that was a bit of a whirlwind. <laughs> um, <laughs> The challenges associated with traditional surveillance methods that I talked about in that first chapter um, call for the development of innovative and complementary methods like environmental DNA, um, which is what my second chapter focused on. So this was an additional opportunity that I pursued and my first foray into uh, molecular biology. And um, I had very little idea of how challenging it would be. So as you can recall, the efficacious active traps are costly and difficult to transport. Passive traps have comparatively low efficacy and the technical knowledge necessary to correctly identify species um, of larval mosquitoes makes larval habitat monitoring pretty challenging too. Um, so these complementary molecular surveillance techniques like eDNA, can actually enhance the efficacy of monitoring and early detection of invasion. Uh, also in the context of Hawaii, they offer flexible option um, that can be used for preliminary surveillance in places that are hard to access and, um, and it's pretty lightweight. So we and all organisms are shedding DNA all the time and it can be captured almost anywhere. EDNA is a really cool uh, surveillance tool that has um, gained a lot of popularity in the last decade to monitor diverse taxa by detecting small degraded fragments um, of genomic DNA and remnant cells within water, soil, and even the air. Mosquito surveillance using eDNA um, of other mosquitoes, including Aedes japonicus, have demonstrated higher detection probabilities when they're compared to traditional surveillance methods. But these techniques haven't been developed yet for Culex funcofasciatus, which was um, the main objective of, of this part of, of this project. 
The application of eDNA for mosquito monitoring involves sampling water from larval habitat um, to determine if there's presence of trace mosquito DNA. So in larval habitats like rock pools, ground pools, and hoo cavities, um, they can look, they can appear to be unoccupied, um, but they may contain remnant DNA from recently emerged mosquitoes that have left larval or pupil casings behind. And this is where eDNA can come in. So to build a functional eDNA assay, you need to collect and filter a sample from a site of interest, preserve that sample, um, perform a DNA extraction, and finally run a quantitative PCR assay to determine presence of the target species. And while this process looks neat and pretty straightforward, it's not so simple, turns out. <laughs> Uh, DNA can degrade quickly in the environment or during sample collection and processing, resulting in false negatives, or contamination can occur resulting in false positives, um, both of which have huge impl implications for the study system. And while all steps along the way require optimization, uh, my chapter focused primarily on step four of this pathway. So quantitative PCR for eDNA relies on the amplification of a species-specific target genome region, which in this case was the cytochrome oxidase subunit 1 gene of the mitochondrial DNA. During qPCR, the original DNA is denatured, allowing complementary primers and a fluorescent probe to bind to the target sequence, as an enzyme creates exponential amplifications of the target. And using the primers together with that fluorescent probe that's specific just to QLEX, we expect to see exponential amplification represented by a fluorescent curve like the one in the green, um, indicating a positive detection. So the first challenge of this research was to design a primer probe set specific for QLEX. Um, next, they needed to test for specificity of that assay using in silico analysis. And finally, develop a sampling protocol um, and assay parameters in the lab. As a starting point, I used a primer probe set that was designed by the USGS. And to evaluate the specificity of this assay, um, to make sure that it would just amplify QLEX, I downloaded available sequences of the gene region of QLEX um, to first confirm conservation of that target region across globally distributed QLEX, as well as um, do a multiple species alignment for um, comparing with species that were closely related, like all of the co-occurring mosquitoes in Hawaii, as well as distantly related ones like the feral pigs. And from this analysis, um, I decided to design a new forward primer to increase assay specificity of the, of the currently present primer, or assay, sorry. So from the primer design analysis, I generated three uh, forward primer options that had more than two single nucleotide mismatches with all closely and distantly related species. Together with the reverse primer and probe is targeted a 298 base pair fragment, um, or base pair region of the COIG. Using extracted genomic DNA, uh, there was no evidence of cross amplification uh, of co-occurring mosquito species across all of those primer probe sets, which can, was one level of confirming assay specificity. And to look at sensitivity, I used a tenfold standard dilution series of extracted QLEX DNA and had to, of a known concentration and had detection of that through the dilution of one to a million, which is um, pretty small. So the standard curve on the right represents the comparative efficiencies um, or performance of the primer probe sets, and primer 64F was selected based on the highest efficiency. I further optimized and confirmed specificity of the assay uh, by testing a thermal gradient for the annealing temperature of the reaction and doing a melt curve analysis. So on the left, there's an agarose gel image that um, shows single bands, which indicate the assay was robust across the thermal gradient. And the optimal uh, annealing temperature identified was 60 degrees, which is, um, results in the fastest amplification without generating nonspecific amplification. 
And these single bands together with the uh, single narrow peak of the melt curve confirms that we are amplifying a single target. So with an assay selected, um, the next step was to confirm that it could be used to amplify an actual eDNA sample taken from water with known QLEX presence. And this step is pretty complicated because it involves the successful realization of all three steps along that pathway. Um, the sampling technique, sample preservation, um, extraction, and inhibitor removal steps all need to be successful to result in a positive detection, even if you have a functioning assay. So to collect um, positive control samples, I collected and filtered larval water from the lab um, colony of mosquitoes at, at the University of Hawaii that I've been caring dearly for and um, using a lightweight filtering technique that would facilitate sample collection in the field. Eating extractions on three samples resulted in positive amplifications represented by the green curves um, across all three replicates for each individual sample, and there was no positive amplification in the negative control. Um, samples are denoted by the colored bars. I know this um, picture is a little busy, um, but this result confirmed that the sample collection, preservation, and extraction methods were effective for being able to detect that trace DNA. Um, and but this is still just the beginning of the journey and needs a lot of a lot more testing with samples from diverse conditions um, to really define all of the parameters of this of this assay. So the main outcome of my study was a high efficiency species specific primer probe set for the detection of eDNA of QLEX. I performed uh, the foundational steps necessary for this assay to be tested on samples collected from the field as a tool for detection. And another thing I think would be really interesting and would love to do is um, test un to understand more the influence of biotic and abiotic variables on detection. So looking at how things like larval density or um, sunlight could influence our probability for detection. So in conclusion, uh, the results of, of the three-tier surveillance present uh, a comprehensive view of the landscape scale dynamics um, occurring among mosquito distribution, suitable climate conditions, and larval habitat availability. With the addition of complementary techniques like eDNA, um, we can develop enhanced monitoring. And of course, continue to, continued monitoring and management across all systems um, will be will be and is always necessary to support the continued um, conservation of native Hawaiian forest birds. Grad school can be a kind of lonely journey in your own mind, but with all of the collaborators um, that I had, I rarely felt alone. Uh, the most This is probably the most rewarding part of this work was just all of the amazing people and teams that I was able to work with. It's an incredible community and I was am so blown away by just the passion and commitment of everybody um, that works in this field. So together with the birds I think we've got a super strong team. And finally I'd like to thank my committee members, my advisor Pat Hart for his never-ending support of all of my heart's curiosities <laughs> and relentless optimism to Catherine and Renee for showing me what it means to be a strong female scientist. And you have been my absolute rocks along the way. To Matt Knopf for always providing unique insight and encouragement. Uh, Dennis LaPointe for offering wisdom and expertise every step of the way. Uh, you've been a bit of a spirit guide for me. <laughs> <laughs> and Carter for his expert support with eDNA development. Um, and of course, none of this work would have been possible if I couldn't afford to eat. So for that, I'm very grateful for PyCask and Friends of Hakalau, um, to all my collaborators for supporting me with data collection analysis, the field and lab support, and of course, my family and friends. So I guess that's it. And I will open it up for questions. Hopefully you're all still awake. <laughs> Do 
Thank you, Steph. So typically we'll just go through oops, questions for a while and then um, at about 11 o'clock, we'll stop the Zoom portion of the meeting and we'll just have a separate meeting with you and your committee. Okay. Okay. Great. Oh, yes. I can't. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, I can't actually see the question. Sorry, I'm trying to. <laughs> okay. Thank so, you all for coming. Also, everyone on Zoom. It feels you feel so far away. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, does anyone hear? Yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, great job. Steph, you did a super excellent, excellent job. And it's so amazing how much work accomplished. Okay. Um, I guess my first question is about that current current like, occurrence of a Stephanicus in, in paints and the model mm -hmm. That's super interesting, right? It's like what's happening with them? Are they competing? Do you have a sense of um the sort of larval densities that you found in those co-occurring, you know, were there a lot more chiconicus, for example, or, or just a, a handful of things? Yeah. Just starting to, to start to think about that 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 question a little further out is like, would they be competing? You know, could chiconicus act as a sort of um, kind of buffer for invasion of of quinks? Totally. Their auditions. Yeah, I think um, this is something. Oh yeah, sure. Um, so Catherine was asking if um, about the uh, larval den comparative larval densities, relative densities of um, Culex and Aedes japonicus in the Pu'u cavities. Um, and that is actually something that I did not measure um, and wish that I had. I was sort of, at, when I started, Dang. it was oh, an wow. idea just to look for presence. Join absence. the meeting. And um, by the end, I when I was detecting Culex, I realized, oh shoot, I probably should have been looking at these at this the whole time. Um, so I don't have I don't have a super good sense for that. Um, but uh, from so I would collect the larvae and rear them, um, and from those numbers of the developed larvae, there were significant. Well, I won't say significant. There were substantially less Culex. Um, emerging than 80s. So the relative abundance was different. Um, but yeah, I did not, I did not systematically count that. Yeah, yeah. I could do it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Question. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of amazing work, great jobs, but I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, first of all, amazing work. Um, yeah, you and all your you know, people, it's just amazing. I had the opportunity to follow these vehicles, <laughs> and uh, it's super, it's super cool um, it, to see this starting new trend in a single because you're seeing parts of it and seeing everything. But it's just, just amazing. So congratulations to you all. Mm -hmm. Um. I have two questions. Um, one of it is so from so from your um, climate analysis, you say that even in the high elevation forest, you still have some months that you have the um, conditions for the normal for the standard possible, right? Mm -hmm. And you also found all these wild habitats around there. So why the mosquitoes are not there yet? Is yeah. there anything else happening or? We yeah, it's a good question, and it's actually a question that uh, that Dennis wrote in a paper ten years ago. Oh, sorry. Okay, um, the question was um, if we have the the suitability conditions at the highest elevations um, for both vector and parasite development, um, then why aren't Culex there? 
Um, and I think, that, yeah, it's been a question for a long time. And I think that um, both in the past and, and now too, like the results that I have support that management is likely a really important factor. Um, Hakalau is a really isolated site. So distant from humans and artificial habitats created by humans that mosquitoes love. Um, it's also, uh, you know, there's fencing and um, and it's distant from roads, forestry roads, which can also serve as corridors for invasion. So it has sort of, I think that's my best guess is um, based on all, on all the studies that have been done and, and the data that I collected is, um, yeah. Um, the second question is, so the EPNA is a method that you can use a lot of instruction. Right. right. So, um, and I think you talk a little bit more about other methods that you can incorporate, uh, like sound traps, and making the those traps more efficient, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that sounds a lot like integrating past managements, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so can you tell us a little bit more about what is the strengths of the DNA over trappings mm -hmm. and how you see they working together? So if you are doing ETNA, do you need to pair, do you need to trap, use a hundred traps or just 10, it's not a lot of DNA. And what is the weakness of it that other methods can offer? Sure. Okay, so um, Danny's question was um, related to eDNA alongside um, traditional surveillance methods and um, in thinking about integrated pest management across all of these different surveillance methods. So how can, um, how can eDNA be applied? And then also what are the weaknesses of it? Um, so yeah, it's a super good question. I, um, I think that in the literature and other scenarios, it's been used as a complementary method um, and sort of as a preliminary detection because um, you know you can pop it in your backpack when you're walking. You can take a sample pretty quickly out of larval habitat that you come across. Um, and not that genetics are cheap, but um, but yeah, do, being able to um, to sample with that level of ease is really great. Um, and I think if there were positive detections, then you could implement sort of a more robust surveillance strategy. Um, and then weaknesses of eDNA is that it's really, you know, challenges every step of the way. So contamination, for example, can occur um, when you're collecting the samples, when you're transporting them, it can happen in the lab. There's a lot of eDNA labs that make you shower in between. So you've got to have this whole infrastructure um, in place to be able to really effectively implement that. Yeah, is that your question? Yeah, Renee. So I'm curious, how do you see the EDNA assay applied here in Hawaii? Mm -hmm. um, well, oh, sorry guys. <laughs> Um, so Renee asked uh, how I see the eDNA assay uh, applied here in Hawaii, and um, there is this very cool project happening at, um, at the USGS um, right now, looking at um, taking some field, field samples, big picture. Um, so that's, I think, like, we're starting to build the, the groundwork, right, for, um, for the application of it, but in the future, I think it'll be really helpful for um, understanding the efficacy of techniques like IIT. Um, so being able to, to take samples um, and understand if we have, uh, if those techniques are being efficacious. Thanks. There's a question on, there's a question on Peter Stein. Um, yeah, Peter, if you want to unmute. Yeah, oh, I have to. Sorry about that. Um. Yeah, hi. Thanks. I think you should be able to speak. Yeah. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, thanks. Um, this kind of follows up on the last question. Um, I got the sense that there's promise using the eDNA as a monitoring tool, but it's not ready for prime time. Um, you know, we desperately need better ways of detection, 
where do you think we're going next with this and how soon can we have a reliable monitoring system in place? Yeah. Um, thanks for the question, Peter. Uh, so right now I'm working with USGS uh, to test field samples from a project on Maui um, from the Kipahulu Valley. So um, this is something that I'll be doing next week in the lab. And um, hopefully if those results are positive, then I think that, um, that, that we're really close um, to being able to have something that we can actually uh, implement on a broader scale. Thanks. Yeah. Which aspects of the passive tracks do you think are are limiting insights? Is it the lure or is it the actual track Yeah, I think I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, so <laughs> Amanda asked um, about the efficacy, what's limiting the passive uh, trapping efficacy and, and why they're so much lower than the other active traps. I think that um, it's both the lure, like there's always over the years, there's been a lot of improvements that have been made to the lure. Um, and as well as the fact that it's passive. So these active traps, they've got a lure in, the, in addition to this fan. That, so the mosquito doesn't actually have to enter fully into the trap. It just goes in the vicinity and is sucked into it. Um, whereas the passive trap has a little bit more more steps um, to actually uh, end up in the sticky card, which is the, the adhesive where it gets trapped. Um, and then there's also issues with sticky cards, like in really humid places um, like Hakalau, um, it's not that sticky anymore after a short period of time. And, and so yeah, that really compromises its ability to, um, to, to show us what's out there. And the kind of follow-up question to that, is there any, Concern with bycatch with these traps. I don't know if we have any native insects that are endangered in these forests. Yeah, that's a problem we need to be concerned about. I'm just curious. Totally, um, definitely. Um, I so <laughs> Amanda asked if there's a problem with bycatch um, in these traps. If there's any like native insects that we need to be worried about capturing, and and yeah, bycatch is a is a really big issue with these traps. Um, and sound is actually a really cool way um, that we can make the traps more specific. Um, so by using sound, so um, male mosquitoes are attracted to female mosquitoes through their through sound. And, and um, by using the sound in addition to these traps, you might expect to get less flies or you know these insects that you don't want. Um, but yeah, it's definitely definitely something to be concerned about it. Yeah, Nicole. Hi, yes. Um, great presentation. I was curious, where do you picture sound traps being a really good tool? Like, what do you feel like is their optimal setting for sound traps for Aculex? Yeah, um, I think the biggest sound traps are amazing because they have the potential to trap male mosquitoes. So almost all of our um, trapping systems are designed to trap females. And so I think um, in terms of where, I, I think um, testing them at low elevations is probably a good plan first before we can really understand how well they function. Um, so maybe some kind of like comparative efficacy work um, as a preliminary step to then, you know, if that is successful, being able to use it uh, in, in the field to do IIT monitoring and, and um, that. So thanks. That's a, that's a great question. That's cool. Yeah, Momo. Hey, Steph. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, first of all, awesome, awesome work. Great job. Um, this work is super important and I love how applied all your researches. Um, my question is related to chapter one. Um, I thought it was really interesting how you looked at like the pH of the hapu'u cavities and how you saw the pH increase over time. And I was wondering if you um, noticed any change in like the density of larvae that were living in those hapu'u cavities as they aged. 
Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So um, similar to Catherine's question, I didn't measure the I didn't look at density. Um, but one thing that I um, did try to do is do some modeling for 80s Japonicus occupancy, which would be a really cool thing to do for Culex if I had had more detections. Um, and so those older those older cavities um, were they have the lower conductivity and the higher pH. So it's for 80s, these are like really optimal conditions. And so um, I, I didn't make any detections in fresh cavities um, and I did have some in intermediate. So I did see differences in larval occupancy sort of across the cavity ages, which um, you know corresponds with some of those parameters too. Um, but looking at the microbial communities in, um, in that water, I think would be another cool avenue. Yeah, I was pretty curious about it. I mean, it makes sense that like maybe you wouldn't see larvae established right away if like there aren't as many bacteria in there like breaking down the hapu. So anyway, thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. Yes, Pat. <laughs> um, one thing you spent a lot of time on was looking at sphagnum because there's a huge uh, zone of sphagnum at Hakalau. Yeah. And can you just talk about some of your findings a little bit? Sure. Uh, the relationship between sphagnum and potentially mosquito breeding habitat. Yeah. So Pat was asking about um, some work that I did as a side project, um, looking at uh, sphagnum. So Hakalau has oh, sphagnum. No, Join the meeting. Hi, Dad. Sphagnum moss. <laughs> um, <laughs> sphagnum moss is um, all over Hawklaw in the lower refuge, in the lower part of the refuge. And so, one of the things that I would, as I was trying to answer the question that Danny asked, you know, why aren't there Culex in Hawklaw? I thought maybe it's because of the sphagnum. And so, um, it's not something that I've thought about in a while, um, but I collected sphagnum water and brought it back to the lab and did some um, comparative experiments between regular um, oviposition water that we would use for Culex in the lab versus, um, versus sphagnum water and looking at um, trying to get an idea if there was some kind of preference or if they were able, if larvae were able to first preference and then secondarily if larvae were able to develop in the water and, um, and if they had slow development and this was an experiment that I didn't um, continue over time. I did just a few preliminary ones. Um, but as far as I could tell, there was a lot more eggs that were laid in the sphagnum water. Um, but then when I tried to raise them up in that water, I had a really high mortality. Um, so I am not an entomologist and like I tried my best to, you know, do that study um, with the utmost rigor, um, but it's a really hard thing to do to um, these preference studies. So um, yeah, that's maybe some data in my drawer. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, one, well, sure. Okay, I don't okay. Everyone else said already just, you know, amazing. This each chapter could have been its own masters. So you did an awesome job, Steph. I had a question if you have any recommendations. Um, because you showed that the biogens are more effective at, at capturing than the passive um, gap traps. But the issue is if we want to detect the mosquitoes encroaching up the slopes of Hakalau. The mosquitoes are most likely going to be at those lower elevations. And as we both know, it's harder to get the heavy machinery down the transect to those lower elevations. Yeah. So do you have a recommendation? Danny talked about using, you know, eDNA and the traps in tandem. Is there a way that we can kind of have some surveillance along the lower border of Hopalau where if QLEX start encroaching, we're aware of it? Yeah. That's a really good question. Noah asked um, about uh, the comparative, so comparative trap efficacy. And so the BG traps are more efficacious than these other traps, but still, you know, really not super feasible to getting to the lowest elevations of the places that we expect to see the first signs of invasion. So um, what kind of, uh, what can, what kind of surveillance can we do? And 
Um, I think that eDNA could be one piece of that. It's easier to carry something all the way down. And, and I also know that um, work on Maui that's looking at some co comparative efficacy as well um, has been using BG Pro traps, um, which are lighter weight and they hang in the trees. So um, in terms of thinking of you know, where the birds are and what Culex are attracted to, I think um, they also run off of a lot smaller battery. So maybe something like that um, could be could be another um, another technique. Um, and I think the key is really trying to move towards something that's more continuous over time. So just more funding that we can pay people to, you know, do the super hard work and and cover a more broader range of um, the areas we need to serve to be monitoring. Just each back in on Noah's question, we can make it more like a comment. Mm -hmm. I think uh, also uh, the trap that we use the law of the lure is was developed for IAs, mm -hmm. and which makes sense because IAs is this nasty animal for human health. So it has become the law of the world for mosquitoes, but the mosquitoes are different from the trap, right? So I think. Maybe you can talk about that also. There are some room for study coolest specific and maybe you can come up with floors that are more specific to this, right? Yeah, yeah. And this the stinky water, that's a great point. And the stinky water that um that a lot of people have worked to develop it is an adaptation um in that in those gravid traps. So but yeah, there's always room for for improvement. Very great so gold flies are yeah, yeah. You don't want to catch blow flies, they're awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah thanks so much for all the questions I think um I don't know I think I've been bad at looking at the chat um, but thank you all so much for coming and yeah thank you <laughs>